have two guns, one for each of you. You talked a lot tonight about, you know, the different, um, the different issues that you've had with Dana White. You said you had a great relationship at one point. Uh, he's done a lot of things that to try to discredit you and humiliate you publicly over the years. Um, first of all, how awkward is that? I mean, I saw something that you did recently that was very impressive. Um, they refused to announce whether or not Connor was officially stripped of the title, and, and you pressed him at the, no pun intended, at the press conference. You continued to sort of ask the question from different angles, and he just, you know, did what he does a lot of times. He got a little childish and just kind of shut you down in an arena full of people. How awkward is it to have to, you know, still do your job and, then, and knowing that that relationship is tense? Honestly, it's not awkward at all. I'd be more disappointed if I didn't ask what was on my mind and what was on everyone's mind. So again, I feel like it's my duty. I'm lucky enough to have that credential. I, I understand to a degree that it's a privilege. Um, so if I'm gonna cower or be afraid of repercussions or being humiliated, which I wasn't, um, then I would be more disappointed in myself. So, uh, you know, I, I want to get the answers to the questions and I feel like if I can't get them, then no one else can. So I might as well like shoot my shot, so to speak. Um, but I, I don't feel like he's trying to humiliate me. I mean, look, at times, you know, it's, it's, it's been disappointing. You know, uh, I was supposed to work for Showtime covering Mayweather McGregor, um, and they took me off uh, because he asked for me to be off. That's obviously disappointing. I, I still provide my family, uh, you know, I provide, um, you know, this is how I provide for my family. Um, and so that gets personal at times, but I can't look at it that way. Um, to me, you know, he's just, you know, he's a guy who I cover, who was great to me for many, many years. Um, we may not, you know, be on speaking terms or see eye to eye all the time, but that's not gonna change how I feel about what he did for my career, uh, the access that he gave me. And quite frankly, I feel like I'm still able to do my job just as well, if not better, than when we, you know, were the best of friends, so to speak. So I don't, I don't feel like it hinders me or makes me uncomfortable or awkward or anything like that. He's got a reputation as a grudge holder. Do you think that relationship will ever be repaired? I, I feel like, you know, some, some of the greatest rivals in, uh, in, in, in our history have been able to see eye to eye when it's all said and done. So, um, you know, maybe, maybe there'll be peace in the Middle East before we sit down, but I still feel, I, I, re I reach out to him all the time through the PR and come on my show, episode 400. I'm not, I'm not a grudge holder. Um, my, I, have, I have no regrets, my life is good. So I would, I would love to have, I've prided myself on having good relationships with everyone. Um, and I would, uh, I would love one day for that to happen. If he doesn't want it, I, I totally respect that. So uh, Dana <coughs> tweeted a picture of him and Brock Lesnar. Yeah. Um, and I got all these people tweeting me. Um, I can't see the tweet because Dana's blocked me on Twitter. And Instagram too, um, which is unfortunate. I can't see his Instagram, but um, they were like, Ariel, don't do it this time. Don't do it this time. You know, don't don't break the news. And uh, I even saw someone sent to me. Michael Bisping has a podcast, and he was talking about Brock Lesnar. And he's like, Oh, I'm not going to do an Ariel Hawani. So I've become like a verb now, <laughs> um, which is amazing. What what an honor. Uh, no, but trust me, I'm trying to find out what's going on yeah. with that. His contract with WWE is up in <coughs> April, and uh, but he still has six months left to serve on his suspension from UFC 200 because he failed his drug test um, a after that fight. So even if he comes back, he can't fight right away. Um, but to answer your question, no, I'd, I'd love to get that scoop. I'd love nothing more. I'd, I'd run out of here in a second and break that if I could get that. Because that's my job. It's not because I'm trying to ruin anyone's plans. It's because I get paid to break this stuff. If, if my employer said we don't want you to break news anymore, I'd say, awesome, you know, what do you want me to do now? But it's not because I'm trying to be malicious or, or again, like rain on someone's parade. Um, this is done in every other sport, beat writers, every, not even sports, like everywhere people are breaking. Like that's, that's just you know, what we do. Um, that's part of it, you know, I love to do interviews, uh, you know, things of that nature, but um, I, I just, I felt like they kind of viewed it from a pro wrestling angle, where it was like, you know, we have a show, and we're gonna tell you what to break, and you're gonna wait for us to break the news, mm -hmm. and you've reached a status now, you've reached a point where it doesn't work like that anymore, and that's a, that's a byproduct of their success, that there's people covering the sport that wanna break the news before they're ready to get it out there, um, and, I, and I felt like they didn't quite get that yet. Maybe the new ownership now gets it because they're so big time, but it was still kind of being run as a mom and pop shop back then. Um, but no, I, I would I would gladly break that. You get the last question. Yeah. Uh, can, you, can you talk more about the Journalist Association? Yes. Like, what were your goals when you wanted to establish it? What would you say the purpose is? What protections do you have? 
So um, one of the, the, the words that was used to describe the Journalists Association in its early stages was a fellowship. And I really, I really love that word and um, I really love the meaning behind that word. I, I really love the idea of <coughs> teaching. So when I first started uh, covering MMA, it was amazing, like, you know, people would show up and they're wearing like t-shirts with, you know, the fighter's name on it and things like that, or they're taking pictures with the fighter, or they're asking for autographs. And I was, I was blown away by this, like, you can't do that. Um, there's, a, there's a very famous fighter uh, named Daniel Cormier. He's the UFC light heavyweight champion. And he claims that the first time I met him, I don't remember this, but he, he said to me that he's like, we're gonna be best friends. And he said that I said to him, I can't be friends with fighters. And he was like, what the hell is this guy talking about? Like, why? He didn't understand that. And so he's always like asked me along the way, are we friends yet? Are we friends yet? Because that was always his goal. But for me, like, I'm not having dinner with you. I'm not having a drink with you. I'm not like, there's a, there's a, a clear line here among many other things. So I, I felt one of the reasons why it was important to have a journalist association was to teach other journalists about these values, but also to protect when something like what happened to me happened, other journalists who can't get in, um, you know, if there's a future issue, have a have a, a clear you know group and a hierarchy in place that goes and talks to whatever promoter or manager or whomever is having the issue. Um, what's going on? How do we fix this? Things like that. Before you know something happens, you're kind of on an island all by yourself, and no one really wants to help you. Um, and you know, people were excited when we launched the Journalist Association because there'd be like rankings and Hall of Fame voting. That stuff doesn't really mean much to me. Um, I feel like that's just that's just hollow stuff. You know, it'd be a nice thing to do at some point. But what I really wanted to establish, A, was the group. B, have you know proper members who are doing things the right way, who understand that um, you know getting paid by the people you cover isn't the right thing to do. And some people have said, oh, how hypocritical of you. You got paid once. You know, why would you stop others? I'm not trying to stop, but if you want to be a part, like I, I would never do it now within the journalist association. There wasn't one at the time. Um, sometimes I say like it was the biggest regret of my life and sometimes it was the best lesson because of what I learned You know, it's one of those weird things But I want people to understand why that is a problem and, and why you can't do that because again as I said a lot of these people did not go to journalism school So they don't know these things and so I, I just I really feel like it's an important thing to have and it's something that every other sports ha sport has um, And thus far it's been great. I mean we're still in our you know our baby stages, but I I hope in a hundred years this thing is still around and they'll, they'll kind of look back to what happened you know, in 2016 and say like, this is what sparked it all. Last question here. Uh, yeah, I, see, I was following the story whenever you had got kicked out and um, watched your show on Monday and seeing how everything played out. And I was just wondering like, in what way, if any, that that incident uh, impacted Casey and Esther, if they were shunned at UFC 200 or if they received any type of uh, recognition from like the cameraman or yeah, so Casey and Esther. Casey is my videographer, and Esther is our photographer, um, and they're the couple that I talked about. And uh, you know, again, talking about like sort of, you know, good luck, if you will. They had nothing to do with this, and so I felt horrible that they were now dragged into this mess. Um, and I was thinking like, oh, if I didn't bring him, would he not have been banned and, and thrown out of the building? And if obviously if he wasn't there, because uh, Dana knows him and knows that he. Is, is, is married to Esther, so then he said to like, remove Esther, and I felt bad, it probably wouldn't have happened. But in a weird way, like they were innocent bystanders and all this, and it made the story even crazier. Like, why are these people getting you know, banned? And, and, and they're, they're known to be the best of what they do in our, in our field, best videographer and best, um, best photographer. So that, and, and I think in a weird way, kind of helped my, my cause, because like, now there were like, two really innocent people who had nothing to do with this, who are being affected by it, and people love their work, and the idea of them not being at events really upset people, so that got other people to speak up and say, you know, um, unban them and things like that. So maybe, you know, in hindsight, it was good to bring him because I, you know, I, I had two fall, you know, fallen soldiers to me, but I, I really, I felt, I felt more bad about that than anything because I didn't want them to lose their jobs or to stop making a living. I mean, it's, it's one thing when it's my, my mess up, but they're really great people, so. Um, a lot of people stood up for them. It, it was just, it was, it was overwhelming and it was surreal to just watch it all happen around you. Um, people that you didn't even know knew who you were to speak up. Um, the interesting thing about them was they went on a camping trip on the Monday after it happened. So, so they, were, they were out of any service for three days till Thursday and they had no idea that we had been unbanned until two days later. Uh, and they found out when they came back, could you imagine that, like the reaction? 
Um, I am, still to this day, I have no idea how they were able to go on a camping trip in the midst of this storm, <laughs> but uh, maybe I was taking it a little more personal than they were. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> My calculations are correct. When this baby hits 88 miles per hour, you're gonna see some serious shit.